Uh, you said you had Amy Trask on uh, Birds 365 this morning. I was not able to catch that. Uh, how did that conversation go, John? Uh, went well. I mean, Amy is tremendous on the air, obviously works for CBS now, um, does their other pregame show, um, which is on, on, you know, CBS Sports Network, which in a lot of ways is better than a regular pregame show, to be honest. <laughs> uh, but, you know, obviously she's very good and, you know, she is the highest ranking female in the history of the NFL, um, which I think is you know, and that's why we got her on because of not only Catherine Race here in Philadelphia, but also Kelly Klein in Denver. So all of a sudden, but it's interesting because, you know, Amy got that job in, she was CEO of the Raiders, I think in 1997. So if you think about, that's a long time. That is a long time to, to sort of go from, from her, to somebody else in a, in a in a real significant position of power uh, on the female side. Obviously, it's a male-dominated sport. We understand why. And, you know, she obviously was happy uh, for Catherine and, and, and Kelly and people that have kind of broken through that glass ceiling. But, you know, her wish is that it wouldn't be a story, uh, that someday that, you know, whether it's a, a minority, whether it's um, female, whether it's Asian. You know, we talked about Eugene Chung uh, having some issues, uh, obviously African-American. You know, when it's not a story, when somebody like that gets a job, uh, and that's her hope. And I think it's everybody's hope that, you know, the best person gets the job. But we are where we are in our society, Ryan, and it's, it's not good right now. Yeah, and, you know, you bring that up. What, what's the headline that I see uh, regarding the NFL to halt race norming, review black claims, and $1 billion concussion settlement? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the concussion settlement, had, there's been, you know, jockeying back and forth, and there's, there's a, a federal judge that um, has, has sort of, you know, held up the settlement, and, and the claim is that, uh, the NFL is making it uh, more difficult uh, for minorities to get uh, claims approved uh, for the settlement uh, as far as potential, obviously, money outlays. Um, and the claim is that uh, there's this baseline of cognitive function where uh, the league uh, starts at a different place than it starts with uh, other players, and obviously that that is a tremendously bad look. Um, whether that's been going on or not is still, you know, left to be wrangled. Um, so I, I do see that headline. It's very sort of eye-catching, and it, it's really, really difficult uh, for me to believe that just from a common sense standpoint, um, the league would be that dumb, uh, but we got to wait and see. I mean, that's certainly the accusation. Uh, staying on topic with some other headlines here, and this is certainly nothing new as the Sixers are knotted up at 31 early into this second quarter at the Wells Fargo Center. Uh, the Packers don't know, John, whether Aaron Rodgers will show up for next week's mandatory Mini camp as Jordan Love continues to get OTA reps uh, as we're closing in on the mandatory uh, report date. What's the update and what have you heard and your thoughts? Uh, it's going to be interesting because, you know, there's the new collective bargaining agreement has made things more difficult for players to hold out, even more so than the last one, which made it more difficult. So they keep going in that direction. Uh, in, in previous years, you could forgive fines, um, and that's generally what would happen. Um, so, you know, for all the talk and all the back and forth and uh, all the numbers reported of, of, of people missing mandatory work and getting fined, ultimately when they would come back, more often than not, you would just wipe out those fines. It wouldn't mean anything uh, if you work things out. 
Uh, here, you're not allowed to do that anymore. So if you don't show up, and, and whether it's mandatory minicamp, and remember a lot of teams, Eagles being one of them, uh, scrapped mandatory work in the offseason. The Packers are um, not one of them. Um, so um, he's going to get fined, and he's going to get fined significant money. Same thing in training camp. So it's going to be interesting. I mean, obviously he doesn't need the money. Uh, obviously he can afford it. Um, so we're going to see. I mean, the rubber hits the road, and I think, you know, the Packers are, are probably looking at this as, as a litmus test and trying to see if he's going to show up. And if he doesn't show up, maybe they understand it's a little bit more serious. It seems to be a game of chicken where the Packers are saying, hey, we're not going to trade you. Uh, you have to play with us. Uh, we're willing to make you the highest paid player in football. Uh, we're willing to rip up your contract, which – you know, previously made him the highest-paid player in football, uh, and he's not agreeable to any of this at this particular point. Um, and we're going to see who blinks first. Talking with our NFL Eagles insider, John McMullen. Follow him on Twitter at JF McMullen, Philly Voice and SI.com. Uh, and you can listen to him daily, Birds 365, uh, with Jody Mack, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. All right, so Greg Ward, everyone's uh, favorite wide receiver here in the city of Philadelphia. He, <laughs> he's the old man of the group, John, and you wrote about it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's funny because Jody's uh, on Birds 365 is one of these guys. I mean, he's got him in the Hall of Fame. I, I think the gold jacket is being stitched together uh, as we speak. Like, I, I don't know what's going on. I've said this before. I don't know why fans latch on to certain players and they dislike certain other players. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me at times, Nick Gary being – you know, uh, an instance of a guy who, let's be honest, not very good, not very talented, but he works hard. He played through injuries. He played through a core muscle injury when uh, the Eagles needed him. That's part of the reason the coaching staff thought a little bit more of him than the fan base. But they can't stand the guy. And and then you have Greg Ward, who, uh, look, he's, he's a hardworking player. No question about that. Uh, I mean, he – he he puts his head down and he and he works. So that part of it I get. But I mean, it, 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 I, I've said it pretty consistently. If he's on the field as a receiver, you're not in a good position. And you know, somebody's got to jump up and 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 win that position. And by that position, I mean the third receiver. You know, Devontae Smith's going to be on the field. You know, Jalen Rager's going to be on the field. You have questions there. I mean. You can say whatever you want about Devontae Smith. Bottom line, he's a rookie. There's not a lot of rookies in this league that hit the ground running without hiccups. So I think he's going to be a good player, uh, but there's still question marks. We know there's a ton of question marks after the rookie season uh, of, of Jalen Rager, who was fine twice. We, we found that out. Um, uh, Ed, Ed Kratz and I, um, he was fine twice for being overweight. The Eagles didn't think he was as explosive as he was on, on film at, at TCU. Maybe that was the reason. Um, he certainly wasn't as explosive as he looked in college. Uh, so hopefully, you know, he's down to his college playing weight. Hopefully that helps him. Uh, but there's a lot of question marks there. Uh, the one thing, you know, everybody points to Greg Ward. Yes, he can catch the football. Um, yes, his hands are decent, but I mean, he's not going to scare anybody. He's not going to stretch the field. Um, you know, opposing defenses want him on the field, to be honest. So the sooner people figure that out, the sooner you understand the Eagles understand that though. So it, it's not, the problem is they haven't been able to do better. That's the problem. Now they they, they keep trying and you know, they can, because of the versatility of Devontae Smith, they could do it a, diff a lot of different ways. That third receiver, you know, it could be an outside receiver like Travis Fulgham or J.J. Ortega-Whiteside. It could be an inside receiver like Quez Watkins. It could be John Hightower. But somebody's got to jump up and play. Or they got to go out and get Julio Jones. 
because they <laughs> cannot win football games with Greg Ward on the field for a lot of snaps. They just can't. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, d- does he make the team? Should he make the team? You know, it's interesting. Typically, you know, if you keep five receivers, say, which most teams do, sometimes six, you know, I, I'm not going to say he, he shouldn't make the team because he is uh, a good um, a good teammate. He is a hard worker. He is the kind of, you know, culture guy. as a former quarterback. He understands how to involve anybody. So all the intangibles are good. But usually if you're a fifth receiver or if, you know, you're the rare team that keeps six, you know, those two guys have to do something on special teams. And whether it's being a gunner uh, on on the coverage units, pun coverage units, whether it's a returner, um, you know, Greg's certainly not going to be a returner. Uh, I don't think he's going to be a gunner because he doesn't have the speed. So it does make it a little bit difficult uh, for him to make the team if you're thinking about how you assemble a roster. I, I you know, I could see him being released ultimately if he gets beat out uh, for, you know, one of those top four jobs where, you know, even that fourth receiver is going to play a decent amount. So I think if he fits in as that fourth receiver, I think he's fine. But if he falls below that, then you got to start thinking about special teams, and I don't think that bodes well for him. So you said typically five receivers, if you had to predict right now. I mean, it's Devontae, it's Rager, it's uh, what, Fulgham, obviously, J. Jall, and the fifth. Yeah, I, I don't know if J. Jall's going to make this team. Hmm. Um, I, in fact, I think it, it's probably going to be uh, J.J. or Travis Fulgham. Um, and I would say, you know, he has a chance to beat out Travis Fulgham. Uh, but I would say Travis is going to start ahead of him, so he's going to have to beat him out. Um, and then you start talking about uh, Quez Watkins and John How- Hightower uh, and, and, and players like that. You know, a, a lot depends on how they develop. I, I do know it seems like the team likes Quez a little bit more now. I think he's gotten a leg up. Uh, he's certainly got the speed. They want to get speed on the field. Um, when you're an 11 person, I mean, one of the issues with 12 personnel, the good is, and we had Mike Sealski on the show and he explained the good, the good is, uh, if you go back to Bill Belichick and Rob Gronkowski and Aaron Hernandez, um, you, you, when you put two tight ends on the field, you, you force the defense into declaring something. In other words, you know, are they going to keep the base on there? Base, you know, four three at their four three team. Are they going to keep that extra linebacker uh, who's probably too slow uh, to cover a top tier tight end? Or are they going to put a nickel, a small cornerback who could probably cover them, but it's not big enough, so you can just throw fifty fifty balls. So you make the defense declare what they want to do, and that helps you. On the other hand, if you have 11 personnel on the field, well, you want you I, you want to you want to stress the defense with speed, um, with with three receivers, and even more so teams that, you know, if you look at the Arizonas of the world who use four and five receivers more than anybody else. I mean, that's that's what it's about. It's about stressing the defense with speed. And if you have Greg Ward as one of those receivers, you're not stressing anybody. That's the problem. Uh, A weapon, not an official wide receiver, Dallas Goddard. And, you know, Dallas is already in his fourth and final year of his rookie contract. Uh, He's eligible for an extension. What's the news around that, your opinion around that? Well, I think the Eagles would like to get it done at this point, um, certainly. Now, they have some issues. Obviously, they still have to create space. Um, we talked about Zach uh, ad nauseum. That'll give them $8.5 million when they ever pull the trigger there. They have about $8 million, just under $8 million right now. Uh, so they don't have a lot of wiggle room. Remember, they still haven't signed their their rookie class, so that's going to take up three point seven million about. 
Um, so again, you know, we've talked about all the dead money starting with Carson Wentz. Um, it's an issue, especially with the pandemic and the scale back in the salary cap. So the Eagles don't have a ton of money, but they'd like to find a way to get it done. And we all know how he's tricked by now. You, you, you backload the deal um, over five years, uh, so you make the salary cap a little bit more palatable. And then when you get to the second or third year, you just restructure. Um, that's what the Eagles would like to do. Problem is, you know, I, I think if Zach, uh, Zach, if Dallas uh, bets on himself, he's going to win as long as he stays healthy. Uh, I think he's going to have a, a big year. We got to talk to him today. Um, he looks in in the best shape he's ever been. He knows how big this year is going to be. Now, look, <laughs> you can always get hurt in this league, but if he finds a way to play and now it's 17 games you know it's hard to imagine anybody playing every game but if he plays in the 14 15 range uh he's going to put up big numbers uh and he's going to get a big time deal so it's sort of do you want the security now from his standpoint uh or do you want to bet on yourself the eagles as is their history uh they are they've already evaluated the player They've decided they want Dallas Goddard. He's their future at tight end. And they would like to get a team-friendly deal. That's how they work. So it's kind of up to Dallas in his camp. You know, do you want it? Do you want that security or do you want to bet on yourself? If I were him, I'd roll the dice. But that's, you know, that's difficult to say in a sport like, like football. This isn't baseball. This isn't basketball. Uh, where guys get injured, we were just talking about Joel, but not to the degree in football where football injuries are much more prevalent, to say the least. Talking with John McMullen, just like we do every night at 7.30. Follow him at J.F. McMullen on Twitter. Uh, John, just want your thoughts on a topic not related to the Eagles or the NFL, but Coach K says he's got one more year and he's walking away. Uh, your thoughts on his legacy and his all-time uh, ranking in the in the history of college basketball? Well, I mean, it's it certainly is. You never say the greatest ever because there's so many uh, that you can put in that category. But he's certainly near the top, and that's you know when you're in the conversation, um, that's as that's as good as it gets. And obviously, what he was able to do. Uh, is is pretty impressive, and you think about you know right in the ACC. You talk about Dean Smith, but um, look, even what he did with Olympic basketball, and there was kind of a shift there when the world started catching up. Um, yeah, he's one of the the greatest coaches of all time. I'm glad he he had a little sort of pocket there when he was thinking about going to the NBA. I, I'm glad he didn't. Uh, because it's, you know, in, in the NBA, it's about talent and more than anything else, and it's about managing personalities. I think that would have uh, dimmed the luster a little bit, so to speak, so I'm glad he didn't do that. But, yeah, he's one of the greatest coaches of all time. All right, Johnny Mack, every night at 7.30. Uh, we'll catch up with John tomorrow night, same time, and make sure you're tuned in to Birds 365 every weekday starting at 8 a.m., going up until 10 a.m. All right, John, go watch uh, the rest of the Sixers game, and we'll react tomorrow. All right, thanks, Ryan. Yep, thank you. All right, there he is, Johnny Mack. Time for our nightly conversation with John McMullen, our NFL Eagles insider. You can listen to him every morning, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. on Birds 365. Alongside Jody Mack, you can catch all of his written work on phillyvoice.com and si.com and follow him on Twitter at JF McMullen. All right, let's bring John into the convo now as the 76ers trail 27-23 with uh, under two minutes to go in the first. Uh, as Maxie misses, Dwight gets it blocked. Uh, Washington's coming out swinging. John, how we doing, man? Doing well. Yeah, it's not a not a good situation that Joel's not out there. But this is, you know, seven foot guy, knee problems, 
leg problems. We all know the history of this league with big guys and leg problems. That's why your window was small. We've been talking about it all year, right? Yep. Your window is small, so you got to seize your window, and you kind of see how small that window is. And look, you, all you can do is cross your fingers. I, I said, you know, not a doctor, but I've been around a lot of meniscus injuries. I don't want to hear that with a seven foot, two hundred and eighty pound guy. I don't want to hear meniscus, and that's what we heard. Yeah, it's not. Listen, it, it could have been worse, obviously, um, but well, that yeah, doesn't mean it it's good. Been. <laughs> you know. worse, but I, you know, I'm small tear or not, I find it hard to believe it's day to day. But you know, people were down there and said he looked fine. I, I, I hope so. That's all I can say. Yeah, you can look fine. I, I mean, you know, I talked to a buddy of mine who is finishing up med school so you know whatever take it with a grain of salt i guess um but and he had a meniscus tear actually he was an athlete he had a meniscus tear he's like listen you can rest for four to five six days and go out and play you know depending on the severity of the meniscus tear but he's not going to be 100 percent. and then you had a 7-2 body involved with that so you're dealing with a guy who's had injuries in the past he's not going to be 100 percent. it's it's not a good recipe i think no matter how it plays out no, it's not, um, and, and we'll see how they handle things tonight. Obviously, you know, I, I think you know Washington's off to a pretty good start, um, and it's going to be easier for them to say the least. Uh, I do think, um, I, I, I do think, you know, the pressure starts to build that the Sixers can't get this one. Remember, nobody's lost uh, with a three-zero lead in NBA history, uh, but. I don't trust this team without Joel Embiid out there. Um, I, I don't know how you could, uh, but we'll see how it shakes out. Well, you don't trust them with this series right now with the three-one lead. Like I, I agree with you. I, I don't give them much hope. I, I think this. I, I think this. I expect them to win this game. Right. But if they don't win this game, um, then I think the doubt starts to creep in especially if Joel can't get out there. I think it starts to creep in. I certainly think you're getting the game seven. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it's just the key game to me. No, I'm I'm with you. You don't want to go back to Washington 3-2. Now they get to go back home. Like that's without Joe. That's not a good situation to find yourselves in at all. And then you start, you want to go that far <laughs> and you start thinking about, you know, no team in NBA history has been up 3-0 and lost a series, and you're sitting here at 3-3 <laughs> with no Joel Embiid. That is a lot of pressure, Ryan. That is a big matzo ball, as Jerry Seinfeld would say. <laughs> um, I'll have to look up how many times a series has gotten to the seventh game after it was 3-0. Even that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'd have to look that up. I know nobody's come back from 3-0. They've done it in, obviously, baseball now. Uh, most famously, the Red Sox coming back on the Yankees. They've done it in every other sport, but they haven't done it in basketball yet. Yeah, it's um, it's tough to do. Four NHL teams have overcome 3-0 deficits. Uh, one occurred in the Stanley Cup. Three comebacks were completed with Game 7 on road ice. Um, and then you mentioned obviously the Red Sox. So it's, it's, you can count on really one hand, two hands, how many times it's happened in any of the four major sports and leave it up to Philly to, um, you know, add to that. Well, you, you know, in that type of situation, you almost have to have a curveball. And obviously, you know, if you're up three, one and the potential MVP goes down, you know, that's the type of, of knuckleball that can screw things up. Obviously they would have wanted it. They would have swept if Joel doesn't get hurt. But, you know, that that kind of injury is going to bolster the confidence of the other team. There's no question about that. And Sixers, you know, had a chance to uh, to steal that game four, weren't able to get it done. And, you know, Ben Simmons, I don't, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Am I allowed to criticize him today? Or am I not allowed to criticize him? It, it, it seems like you have two camps, and neither can acknowledge. As I said, he does a lot of things really well. So you have this one camp that thinks he's just atrocious, which is not true. 
And then you have this other camp who thinks, you know, this weird, uh, you can't, you got to stick by your players and you, you got to, you can't say anything negative about them. And look, it's bad, especially in close games at the end of, um, it, it, you know, if you need closers on the floor, it's not good to have them out there. It's just not. And that's with Joel, never mind without him. 